everybody, this is Matt Paleli. I'm the Director of Marketing for Mundelein Seminary, and uh, today we are honored to have His Excellency Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop, thank you for being with us today. Good to be with you. Always good to be back on this campus. Yeah, so what does it feel like to be back here, back in the Mackesy? Great. I love this place. You know, I've loved it since I was a kid when I first came up here, and it's meant the world to me. I've spent a lot of my adult life at this place. And this particular building, uh, I know Bill Mackesy very well, the man that gave the money for this, and um, I was here as a teacher when it was being built and uh, enjoyed working here too when I was a faculty member. So it, it just means a lot to me to be back. It's beautiful. What do you miss about this place? Oh gosh, everything, the beauty of it. You know, the combination of natural beauty and architectural beauty and the way they come together. Uh, Cardinal Mundelein was a genius. He's ever a hero of mine. Uh, Mundelein was an extraordinary figure to basically have invented this place from nothing. I mean, to raise the money for it, to buy it, to cultivate it, and then to plan the architecture. Extraordinary accomplishment. So I mean, I miss that, but I miss the people. I, I spent this morning with uh, a couple of the ladies I've known here for a long time, and, and then some of my former faculty colleagues I, I saw last night over in the faculty building. I miss the people here, you know, but I, I miss this place, which has always been kind of mystically charged for me. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you have any particular favorite spots on campus? Yeah, you know, the, that spot, uh, what do we used to call it? Franciscan Point, uh, across the lake, on this, this sort of far side, you go over there and near the uh, retreat house, and then you cut in toward the lake and you, you look back toward the main buildings, toward the chapel. That's one of my favorite spots. Um, of course, the John Paul II Chapel, which uh, I helped to, to renovate when I was rector. Uh, and we brought in the stained glass windows and that gorgeous portrait of John Paul II. That is a very special place for me. Um, I'd say those two, Franciscan Point and the John Paul II Chapel. You mentioned uh, Cardinal Mundelein and him kind of being a hero of yours. Yeah. With this being the centennial year, do you have any particularly interesting or um, enlightening stories of him and his character and kind of what he put into this place? Well, as I say, I think he was something of a genius. He was a churchman in the full sense of that term. Um, he was a, a, you know, a preacher and a teacher, um, but he's someone who had a vision for what he wanted to accomplish. And he was the right man for that time, you know, as the immigrants are coming into this country and Catholics are seeking an identity and a pride. Um, bringing the Eucharistic Congress here in 1926, that was hugely important for Catholic identity. And building this place, um, this is his legacy. Uh, the fact that we're here, you know, 100 years later is extraordinary. Because anyone that's been involved in even putting up one small building knows how complicated that is and how many factors there are. To have imagined this place, to have made it happen practically, he had that extraordinary combination of, of vision and practicality. And, and those rarely come together in the same person. Um, he also governed the diocese, they say largely from up here. You know, he lived at his house across the lake, would go into the city, you know, from time to time, but he, he loved it up here. Knew the seminarians well, knew them personally, which I admire. He knew, you know, priests are the key to the success of the archdiocese, so he was dedicated to that. Um, so I, for all those reasons, I really admire Mundelein. Died young, you know, it's amazing, with, given what he accomplished, I think when it first dawned on me that the man was only in his 60s when he died. I thought that was extraordinary. Um, so a man that packed a lot into his, into his life. Kind of going off what you just said, how do you see Cardinal Mundelein's dream being fulfilled today at Mundelein? Or what do you think he would think if he saw campus and everything today? Oh, I think he'd be pretty proud of it. Um, I think it has been fulfilled. As I say, the fact that a hundred years later, here we are living literally in what he envisioned. Um, and, you know, as a training ground for priests for around the country, Mundelein would have gotten that. He had the dreams about, you know, a Catholic university being constructed here. That never came true. But that this would have a national impact, you bet. And uh, it still does, shaping the priests for this country. Cardinal Mundelein would have appreciated that immensely. And that it contributes still to a Catholic pride and a Catholic sense of, of identity and purpose. Uh, I think he'd be very proud of that. He'd be, he'd be proud of the seminarians and be very interested, I think, in getting to know them personally. Um, so, I mean, his spirit is all over this place. And the fact that he's buried right next to us here in the main chapel, uh, I was very aware of that. Whenever I'd bring people to this campus for a tour, I would take them back there and show them 
the grave of Cardinal Mundelein because uh, his spirit's every place here. So I kind of want to get into your experience of Mundelein as you know a seminarian and then yeah. faculty and then rector. So you've probably said this a million times, but can you give the sort of the elevator version of your vocation story? Oh, the vocation story is really at Fenwick High School in St. Thomas Aquinas when I first heard one of Thomas's arguments for God's existence. I was a 14-year-old freshman at Fenwick High School, and it. I see it now as a, as a grace. It was a, it was a breakthrough of God into my life. Not that I, I you know, didn't believe in God, I did, but there was something about that moment that just awakened me, first intellectually and then at, at deeper levels of my life too, and that set me on the, on the path that I'm still on. So that happened when I was a, when I was a kid. Um, and it, of course, unfolded and changed in different ways over the years. But a big part of the vocation story is, uh, is coming here to this place which I first saw when I was a college seminarian. Um, came up here from Niles College on a beautiful spring day and uh, saw it for the first time, and it was magical. And I said many times, it's true, even when I came on this campus last night when I came for this lecture, I, I never come on this campus without sensing some of that same magic. And just being here and going through my training and, and my classes and the liturgies, um, that had a huge impact on the way I think about the priesthood. Yeah. What was your experience of seminary life? What was seminary life like back it then? It was good. It was much, well, we were only about 90 students maybe uh, in my time, so it was smaller. Uh, There's probably a greater proportion of Chicagoans in those days. There were uh, seminarians from around the country, but not as many as there are now. Um, probably a little more of a, like a hometown feel because we were pretty small. We, we got to know each other pretty well. I think of it as a, you know, a rich time intellectually and spiritually, but also a lot of fun. Uh, the CAMs, as we call them here, we still have them, um, that's sort of your community. Uh, the CAM meetings, <laughs> which I find incredible now that began at 10 p.m., you know, and often went till, I don't know, midnight or 12.30, but when you're 22, you can handle that. Uh, I think of those years with a great deal of, of affection and, and uh, very, very fond memories. And, you know, friends I made there are still friends of mine. Uh, now that I'm a long way away, but I still come back to Chicago from time to time and, and see my old classmates from here. So, um, you know, I, I think of them as really happy years. Yeah. Were there any experiences here that were particularly formative that you kind of still go back to sometimes? I think maybe the, the classes of, of John Shea, um, Jack as we call them, Jack Shea was probably the star of the faculty in those days. And, uh, he became sort of a mentor to me, and I, we did a lot of independent studies. And uh, with him, I was introduced to a lot of contemporary theology. So I had a background from my Catholic University days in Aquinas and the classical tradition. But Jack uh, introduced me to a lot of the contemporary theologians. And uh, just, I remember the times in, in his room where he and I would just meet one-on-one uh, -on -one and discuss a, a book of contemporary theology. Those are, are powerful memories I have from those years. So then, get ordained, live that parish priest life yeah. for a while, and then when did you come back uh, as a faculty member? I came back in 1992. I, I was ordained in 1986, spent three years in a parish, St. Paul of the Cross in Park Ridge. Then I was sent to Paris. I did my doctoral studies there at the Institut Catholique in Paris, which I love. That was a great experience. Then came back in the fall of 1992 to begin teaching. And uh, my early memories of, of teaching, there's a big teaching load here. In those days, we are on the quarter system. That's, I changed that when I was rector to a semester system. But um, in those days, you had to teach, as I remember, three courses per quarter was the regular teaching load, which meant I arrived and suddenly had to come up with nine courses. And so my early months and years at Mundelein, it was like a lot of reading and writing and preparing. But they were important years for me. For example, I. I read Balthazar for the first time in those years. And Balthazar has been hugely influential in my own thinking and writing. But I first came across him really as I was preparing classes. Um, but you know, I was young and I was enthusiastic about theology. And so I, you know, I love those years, but it was, uh, it was a heavy teaching load. Yeah, was that something you had thought about before you were asked to join the faculty? Was it something you kind of aspired to or? To teach here? Yeah. Well, I knew that, I mean, I love the life of the mind. I love theology, and, and they knew that from the time I was a student, and that's why the diocese, you know, fostered my going for doctoral work. So I think, yeah, there was kind of a mutual sense of this would be good for me, good for the archdiocese. I love parish work, I must say. Uh, 
St. Paul of the Cross, I still have connections there, uh, right near O'Hare Airport, and um, loved it, loved those years. But, but yeah, it was probably like, um, it was like a, a duck to water, you know, when I uh, uh, got here, it, I just, I found the life very agreeable. Loved teaching from the very beginning, loved it. Uh, today I was over in the, uh, that alumni room, and uh, there's the 25th anniversary class, and it seems like yesterday. I taught all those guys. They were, they were the fellows who were here in my very early years of teaching. So they were, they were wonderful. Yeah, that's cool. So then um, moving on to becoming rector, was that yeah. unexpected? or? Um... Yeah, it was. I was um, I'd been teaching for a long time, but then Cardinal George took me aside one day up here, and he said, I want you to jumpstart evangelization. He knew I was doing this work in, you know, preaching and, and some of the early media stuff. And uh, I said, to him, well, what do you mean? Uh, and he said, I don't know, but I want you to do it. <laughs> so that's when Word on Fire, my media ministry, really kind of kicked into gear because he wanted me to reach out to the culture. So under his sort of guidance and tutelage, I began doing that. So I was still teaching, but I was kind of part time at that point. And he also at that uh, moment gave me permission to do the Catholicism series. I had this idea to do a 10-part series to go all over the world and show the Catholic faith. And he loved that idea and gave me permission to do it, which meant I was only teaching, I think it was maybe one course uh, a quarter, maybe two courses a year at that point while I was traveling the world. So that's what I was doing at that point. And in fact, Cardinal George came to the Word on Fire office, which was in Skokie at the time, and he said, I want to thank your team for the Catholicism series. We just published it at that point. I said, great. So he came and we had mass, we had lunch. And after lunch, he said, I'd like to talk to you. So I had no idea what he wanted. And he took me in the office and said, I, I want you to be rector of the seminary. And it was a great surprise. I mean, I, I knew the seminary well, loved it, but I was not thinking about that. Um, I remember saying to him, well, as far as I can tell, what the popes want us to do is form people for the new evangelization. And he said, yes. So, all right, got my marching orders. I knew what I wanted to do. And so, yeah, I became rector in 2012. But um, that's how it happened. Yeah. Can you talk about, um, I've interviewed some alumni priests uh, who were here while you were rector, and they talk about the, I think it's, there's three things that you tell them from the outset that, that kind of guide their Oh, the three priesthood. paths of holiness? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so when I became rector, um, I'd written a book some years before called The Strangest Way, and Walking the Christian Path, and I laid out these three kind of moments in the spiritual life. It's finding the center, know you're a sinner, realize your life is not about you. So it's the breakthrough of grace when your life is now reorganized around Christ. And then in light of that, you know you're a sinner. Then you come to terms with your attachments and your sin and your addiction. And once you do that, then you're ready to be sent on mission. So then realize your life's not about you. So I thought, well, let's, let's structure the program along those lines. And so I brought in the formation faculty and said, that's what I want to do. And so they did. We kind of, and even the uh, academic formation, in a way, we uh, ordered around those three uh, paths. So I was very pleased with that. I, I, not that they were inventions of mine. They're just really the classical spiritual tradition. If, if you look in the, all of our great masters, you'll find something like those three paths. So, um, I just thought it was a good way of organizing our, um, our program out here. Obviously taking on Rector when you've been here for so long in so many different ways probably felt like a big role to fill and big shoes to fill potentially from your predecessors. Oh, and I, of course, knew all those great rectors, you know, before me. Um, I'll say this, in all my years of priesthood, it's been my favorite job. It's the favorite job I ever had was being Rector here. Um, and I felt you know, ready to do it, because I'd been here for a long time. I knew everybody. Uh, I'd been through about 20 years of this place and of faculty meetings, and so I, I kind of knew what all the issues were. Um, so I, I came into that job with a lot of confidence, and I, I knew what I wanted to do, and I knew this place very well. And I, I loved it, I must say. I loved that job. I loved going to work every day when I was rector. And, you know, part of it is that administrative. It is, just invariably. But I thought a lot of it was... Um, it was intellectual leadership and, above all, spiritual leadership. It, it's being the, the father of the community. That's how I saw being rector, the spiritual father of the community. And so I took that very seriously, and, uh, and I, I loved it. I loved that, uh, that role. Yeah. Did you have any particular goals or legacies? I know JP2 Chapel is obviously a big one. but Yeah. 
I mean, some of the practical things, the Cardinal said to me when I was appointed, he said, I, I won't tell you how to do it, but you've got to resolve this quarter semester issue. <laughs> We've been debating it for literally 20 years. Uh, we were on a quarter system. There were a number of us that didn't like it and wanted to change to a semester system. There were a number who liked the quarter system. It was about evenly divided. And so we had kind of debated it for the whole time I was here, 20 years. And um, I said, yeah, okay. And so pretty quickly we resolved it. <laughs> and I uh, said, we're gonna go to a semester system, which we did, I think, successfully. Uh, that was a practical thing. Uh, the John Paul II Chapel, um, that was a joy. You know, I, I was never happy with the house chapel, the student's chapel. It was very beige, I thought, uh, very much uh, marked by the kind of 1970s spirituality. And John Paul II, at that moment, was just being beatified, and they were talking about his canonization, and he was such an important player for the students at that time. Most of them were here because of John Paul II. So I thought, naturally, let's name it for him. And then bring in color and, and symbolism and narrativity and all these things I thought were missing from that very emptied out beige chapel. So that's what we did. And um, through the immense generosity of a particular donor who basically underwrote that whole project, we're able to do it. And uh, that became sort of my pride and joy. And I, I saw it, you know, as a, maybe my legacy that what I would leave to Mundelein as I left, um, maybe as a sign of, of gratitude for all the years that I spent out here, um, my gratitude to this place. So um, I'm particularly proud of that chapel, yeah. Yeah, well, it's stunning. That, that JP2 portrait is mesmerizing. I know, it's amazing, yeah. Um, how would you say the seminary has changed over the time that you've been associated with it or even after you, after you left? What have you... Well, I, after I left, I don't really, I can't say much about that. I haven't, uh, you know, I've been uh, in California sure. and, and not really focused on this place that much. In the years I was here, um, the arrival of the John Paul II generation. So I started teaching in 92. I was a student here in the 80s, and John Paul was Pope, but he hadn't had an impact yet. Uh, it was still very much, I'd say, the, the post-conciliar uh, church. As he begins to have an impact on the life of the church, the John Paul II seminarian began to emerge which means someone shaped very much by his vision. You know, a love for the great intellectual and cultural and spiritual tradition of the church, a keen sense of mission, uh, a kind of ecclesial confidence, I would say, that the church has something to bring to the culture. All that summed up in the, under the rubric of the new evangelization. All of that, I would say, began to kick in by the early to mid-90s, right when I was uh, arriving as a faculty member. And so I, that, was, that affected a change, I think, in the whole atmosphere of this place, the, the assumptions. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you one very practical change. When I first started teaching, when I was a student, certainly, and even when I first started teaching, the, the priest faculty didn't wear Roman collars. Uh, students didn't, certainly, but the faculty didn't for the most part. And then there were a group of us by the mid-90s who began saying, you know, this is kind of crazy. If I was in the parish, I'd put a collar on if I was, you know, doing pastoral ministry. Well, this is pastoral ministry. I'm, I'm, you know, ministering to these students. So a group of us began to wear the collar without anyone telling us to do it. And I, it just kind of gradually grew as a custom. And by the time Cardinal George came, uh, everyone, I think, was, was wearing the collar. So that's, that's a real evident change, but I think it was, it was indicative of this deeper change to a John Paul II mentality. Yeah. Well, what do you think sets Mundelein Seminary apart from other seminaries? Well, one thing is just the sheer size and beauty and institutional strength of this place. Uh, I, I don't know any rival to it. And I, I've been all over this country in, in the terms of the Catholic world. I've been to most of the great seminaries. There's nothing like this place. So just in terms of its, uh, of its beauty and its institutional um, structure and strength, that, that sets it apart. You know, I'd say this too, even though we serve guys from all over the country, there's something Chicago about uh, Mundelein. And I'm a Chicago priest, a proud Chicago priest. Um, the Chicago style, I think of the great figures when I was a young priest, I knew some of them who were students of Reynold Hillenbrand, who was one of my predecessors as rector here. Hillenbrand was the combination of deep intelligence, of, of keen cultural awareness, and then commitment to social justice. That combination was in Hill, Hillenbrand. Think of the way Hillenbrand um, wanted to bring the liturgy now into the streets and into the culture. So it was a love for the liturgy and the liturgy now in relation to the transformation of the world. 
the great students of his that I knew when I was a young priest, they loved Dante, they loved Aquinas, they loved um, uh, Chartres Cathedral, they, they loved the great Catholic cultural and intellectual tradition, and they loved then how it impacted the world. That to me is, is a beautiful kind of Chicago uh, legacy. And I think this seminary still has some of the uh, Reynold Hillenbrand spirit. When I became rector, one of my first um, moves was to put a portrait of Hillenbrand up in my office because he's been a hero of mine for a long time. It's currently in my office in Santa Barbara. I have a picture of, of Reynold Hillenbrand. But I, I wanted very much to bring that same kind of uh, spirit to this place. I think that makes Mundelein distinctive. Yeah. Obviously, we're celebrating 100 years of the seminary. So what are your, what are your hopes for the next century for Mundelein? Yeah, keep it going. Keep the, keep the Cardinal Mundelein vision alive. Keep the Reynold Hillenbrand vision alive. Um, if I can say it with, with due modesty, keep the, it, it, the vision I had of it alive, which is the new evangelization. Um, keep that Chicago spirit associated with, with Hillenbrand and, and many others. Keep that alive. Keep this place as a national center of priestly formation alive. Um, that's my hope for the next 100 years. When we redesigned the John Paul II Chapel, I remember saying to the donor, you know, well, young men will be worshiping and praying in this chapel for the next 100 years. And uh, I believe that. And uh, I, I hope that's, that's the case, that we carry on this great Mundelein tradition. I don't see any reason why we couldn't. It's grown and, and flourished under the influence of the Holy Spirit for the past hundred years. Why can't it continue? Yeah. To that end, why do you think it's important for Catholics to support Mundelein and priestly formation in general? Because without priests, you don't have the Eucharist. Without the Eucharist, there's no church. So priests are indispensable to Catholic life. Um, that the, you know, the, the church refers to seminaries as the heart of, of a diocese. That's really right, it seems to me. If you're not, you're not attentive to the health of the heart of a diocese, the diocese won't be very healthy. This place is not just for Chicago, but for the whole country. And so um, attention to the heart health you know, of this place is extremely important for the life of the church in our country. If you care about priests, you gotta care about this place. And every Catholic has to care about priests. So that's why you should support Mundelein. Amen. Um, so kind of shifting gears, in your life beyond Mundelein, um, as you became a bishop and moved on to uh, California, yeah. what what did you take with you in terms of your formation as a parish priest to that new role? Oh, everything. Because my, my life now, um, in many ways, is more pastoral. When I was here, I was a teacher, I was a writer, I was doing evangelization, then I was doing administration as as rector. Now, as auxiliary bishop, I'm I'm supervising 40 parishes and I'm in charge of two uh, counties out there. It's one of our pastoral regions. And my life is extremely pastoral. I mean, I'm going to parishes all the time, I'm going to schools, I'm doing confirmations, I'm doing liturgy, I'm preaching in different settings, I'm, I'm handling personnel matters, financial matters, I'm going to meetings all the time. So I'm doing on a kind of maybe larger scale what, what every parish priest does. So I have indeed gone back, I mean, even leap now over my Mundelein years to those years I spent in the parish. Uh, and have drawn on, I had a marvelous first pastor, Joe Kinane, uh, now with God, a great Chicago priest. Um, and yeah, I've, I've relied on, on what I learned and did in those years. Awesome. Um, you talk about Word on Fire, what's, uh, what's new with that? I know it's exploding. Yeah, that's amazing. Word on Fire is like a, it's like a grace. And it happened when I, it started when I was here. So I'm, I'm a professor, I'm, I'm writing books and all that, but I, I just thought we as a church aren't doing enough to use the, the new, but at that time, it really wasn't even the new media. It was just media, which meant for me like radio and television at that time. And so it started. I, I went to my parish where I was helping out on the weekend, uh, Sacred Heart Parish in Hubbard Woods. And I said, I, I need $50,000 to get on the radio for 15 minutes every Sunday morning at 515. That's the opportunity I had at that point. And they, everybody laughed when I said 515 in the morning, but they gave me the money. And so that's how it started. It started when I was a professor here. And then to tell that story, we need another interview, but um, by steady grace and divine providence, it's grown and grown. And now, yeah, it's, it's about 65 people working full-time in several offices around the country. And it's, you know, it's my pride and joy. It's like, a, uh, it's like the John Paul II Chapel. It's something that I've managed to create that is, I think, having an um, ongoing impact in the life of the church. 
Yeah. So with everything that you've accomplished and all the various roles you've had, have you ever thought, what would you say to the college seminarian, Robert Barron, who was coming oh, the to visit here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that visit I met um, Jim Kelleher, now the 90-year-old retired Archbishop of Kansas City. He was rector at the time. And I remember I'm this kid, I'm this 19-year-old kid, and I went into his, I was brought into his office to meet him. And he was just, he's a marvelous man. I mean, gracious and charming, and he was that way that day. And I remember he, I was studying, um, no, I was, I was about to go to Catholic University to begin my philosophy studies at that point. And he spoke very highly of the importance of studies and how we need uh, philosophy and we need teachers. He didn't know me from Adam. Maybe he intuited that I would be a teacher up here someday. But um, what would I say? You know, I'd say to that, to that 19-year-old um, seminarian is, be open to the surprise of God's providence. Um, if you had shown me the trajectory of my life that day, I never would have believed it. I might have seen some parts of it. You know, I might have envisioned, yeah, maybe studies and teaching somehow, but the way my life's unfolded, no, I would never have seen it. So trust in the surprising providence of God. Yeah. That's awesome. What would you say to people? Um, obviously, we, we need priestly vocations. What would you say to people who are discerning a uh, vocation of the priesthood or to those who want to encourage you know, young men in their lives to consider that path? Yeah, the, the second question is easy to answer. It's tell them and tell them specifically. Way too many people, I think, oh, you know, so-and-so, I always thought he'd be a good priest, but I never told them. Well, why not? Tell them. Because again and again, all the studies show that what leads people to a vocation is someone that I respected told me I'd be a good priest, told me you should think about this. So I would say to people, parents and friends and family, whoever, tell them, if you discern, because you can often see more clearly than they can, you can see the gifts, tell them, hey, you know, you've got gifts that would really be good for the priesthood. Because if, if Catholics don't do it, it's not going to happen. You know, uh, uh, and, and priests, my, my brother priests, that we've got to do that too. Find your own successor. Every one of us has got to be on for finding our successors. So tell them. For those who are discerning, um, go to Mass every day. You know, get a good spiritual director. Um, ask the Lord. Be, be focused in prayer. Ask the Lord specifically. Show me. Tell me. And then look for the indications. Look for the signs. You know. Um, but I think that first one, I, I just feel strongly about that, is, is Catholics have got to be clear and straightforward. Tell people. So as we wrap up here, how, uh, how can our viewers and our listeners pray for you? Yeah, please pray for my spiritual protection. So I, I find, um, as I do a lot of public work on behalf of the church and, and to be a public spokesman, you get a lot of uh, blowback. You get, um, you know, negativity. And I, I do believe there's a spiritual warfare. And the dark powers don't like it when we announce the gospel publicly. And so I'd ask people, please, to pray for my spiritual protection. Awesome. We will definitely do that. Uh, Bishop, thank you very much for your time and you're your welcome. service to this institution. Oh, you're welcome. It's my, my joy.